Well, I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> Sounded like you did. The world has lots of theories about what's going uh, on in the inside of people. In that video, I counted six different things that uh, were said about Catherine, poor Catherine, with all of her problems. Uh, here's one of the things. She was given the label of claustrophobic. Uh, another thing that she said is, I'm compelled. And then uh, Bob Newhart said on this one, she said, my horoscope said, and he said, we definitely don't go there. She said, my mother called me fatty. She said, this has been with me from childhood. And then one, while uh, we're all laughing, it's hard to hear, she said, I had this dream. Um, and he said, we definitely don't go there. Uh, the world has hundreds of theories, and just uh, think with me for a moment about what's going on with people and what's causing their problems. There's all kinds of environment theories. My father didn't love me enough. Or there's wounded inner child theories. And then there's the medical theories. It's my brain and the chemical imbalances in my brain. Others would say it's your low self-esteem. That's why you have the problems that you do. There's personality theories. You're a type A. That's why you are like you are. There are literally hundreds of theories that are operating in the world right now as to why humans do the things that they do. So what we're going to do here for the uh, time that we have is look at what the Bible says about human motivation. What's going on in the heart? This is an incredibly important topic, and let me just give you one statistic. This word heart, both in the Old Testament and New Testament together combined, is used over 1,000 times. So anytime, I think you'd agree with me, anytime that the Bible uses a word over a thousand times, don't you think it would be important for us to study it? So we're going to look uh, just for a few minutes here in our time together of what does the Bible mean by the word heart? And we're going to do some studying together on that topic. Uh, you have a diagram in your notes that we lovingly call the three trees diagram. And uh, we're going to test your coordination here. I need you to pull out that diagram and be filling in your outline at the same time. You think you can handle that on a Friday evening? So you're going to be filling in the outline and filling in the three trees diagram. So you'll have to be uh, flipping back and forth. And I'm going to do two things at once here, just to test my coordination and yours. We're going to be looking at this diagram and filling in point two of your outline that talks about some uh, basic Bible passages that have to do with the heart. I'll come back to the diagram in a moment, but let's look at Mark chapter 7. And while you're turning to Mark chapter 7, just to save us a little time, I'm going to quote the following two, Proverbs 4.23 and Jeremiah 17.9. People that do word studies and put together what the Bible has to say about these topics say that for a biblical anthropology, the most important word is the word heart. Now, if someone would have asked me years ago, what's the most important word biblically for the inner person, I wouldn't have said heart. I would have said the word soul. But the word heart is used hundreds of times more than, the, than what the Bible uses the word soul. Let's uh, just take a peek at some of these. You're in Mark 7. Let me quote Proverbs 4.23. Great verse says, Guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the issues of life. Or a famous one, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Uh, I hope what will happen with this brief presentation is that uh, heart verses are just going to start popping out of the pages of Scripture as we think about why do humans do the things that they do? Now, the main passage I'd like for us to uh, be in for just a few minutes is Mark chapter 7, and I'm going to begin reading with verse 21, and as you might guess, this is the Lord talking to the Pharisees, and when you think Pharisee, I know the kind of words that come to my mind when I think Pharisee, 
and they're probably in your mind too. We think um, legalist, we think self-righteous, we think hypocrite, but I would like to propose to you just for a moment to think about the Pharisees, and as I've studied a little bit about the Pharisees, I have often thought of them as um, the pastor's dream team. <laughs> that sounds strange, doesn't it? Now think about it for a moment. They're in church every time the doors are open. They are faithfully studying their Bibles. They are meticulous about their Bible study. They uh, give very faithfully. They are very faithful about their giving. And when you think about the Pharisees that way as the most religious group of people at their time, you wonder, why in the world did the Lord pick on these people so much? Well, we get a hint of that in Mark chapter 7, beginning with verse 21. He says this, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts. You wonder, where do your evil thoughts come from? And the Lord says it's the heart. Fornications, theft, starts in the heart. Murder starts in the heart. Adultery, the heart. This next phrase is interesting because it has both an outward and an inward dynamic, deeds outward of coveting inward, originate in the heart. Wickedness as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness, all these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. Look a little bit earlier in the chapter. The Lord is quoting a famous verse from Isaiah in verse 6. And he said, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. I brought a, um, one of my favorite toys with me tonight, my laser pointer. So... I can point out some various things. We want to talk about what does the Bible mean about this thing called the heart. And let's just start filling in this diagram. Let's start up here. And we're going to be working our way clockwise around the diagram. Let's start with the pressure up at the top. Our counselees come to us because they're having problems. They're experiencing the pressures of life. Uh, think of that as uh, heat. What's causing the heat? What's causing the pressure? And if you think of biblical words for pressure, one of the words that would come to mind would be trials, the circumstances of life, uh, the things that are putting pressure on us. We want to find out why is it that this person with this pressure is responding this way. And we call this the three trees diagram because of this tree this tree, which is central, and then this tree. The bad fruit tree and the good fruit tree and the difference that Christ makes because of the gospel in our lives, even if the pressure of life never changes. So uh, let's be realistic here. Let's uh, take some typical pressure for Los Angeles. Uh, I was in South Dakota last weekend, and I came back on early Monday morning after seeing miles and miles and miles of open plains in South Dakota, and I come back and land at Burbank Airport and see miles and miles and miles of cars. <laughs> Let's talk about traffic for a moment causing pressure in our lives. How do we respond to the pressure of traffic, the heat, the trial, the circumstances of uh, pressure? Here on the bad fruit tree, and notice the dotted line. Your diagram, I don't believe, has that dotted line. You could draw that dotted line, but make sure you draw it precisely, that it's going right across the top of the heart. Because what we're trying to do is divide what the Bible talks about as the inner person from the outer person, or the root system of our life from the fruit system in our life, or the soul from the body inner person, outer person. So what might be going on with the traffic? Well, there might be sweaty palms, there might be angry gestures, and if I was using this to uh, take notes with the counselee, and I'm finding out what's causing the pressure in my counselee's life, 
I would be drawing on the bad fruit tree, all of the bad fruit, the outer person stuff that's coming out, but I want to help my counselee understand the root system, where is this coming from in their inner person, and that's the main topic for this session, which is the theme of what the Bible calls the heart. So all kinds of things can come out, right? When there's uh, traffic, uh, the thought life, anger, maybe fear, etc. All kinds of bad fruit could be coming out in the person's life that's experiencing that, that pressure in the person's life. Up here at the top right, we have a biblical principle of sowing and reaping. Uh, this is not just the biblical principle of what I sow is what I'm going to reap. Uh, that's convicting enough, right? That what I'm going to sow is what I reap. Uh, basically, the whole book of Proverbs is based on that principle. My son, if you go this direction, you're going to get this in your life. But my son, if you go this way, you're going to get this in your life. The principle of sowing and reaping. But sowing and reaping also has the implication with it of habits in our lives. I sow and I reap. I sow and I reap. I sow and I reap. And a person can just get stuck on this side of the diagram. With the pressures of life, I keep sowing and reaping, sowing and reaping, sowing and reaping. And one of the things that you need to just start uh, letting sink in for this presentation is that those habit patterns are coming from something deeper in my inner person that the Bible talks about over a thousand times, and it's this idea of the heart. What we want to see is that by the power of the gospel, let me take you to another passage, Isaiah 61. Please turn there if you would. Isaiah 61, that the Lord, by the power of the gospel, wants to set us free. He says things like this, wonderful things that our Lord promises. John 8, 32. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He makes it possible so that change happens, so that I don't have to keep sowing and reaping, sowing and reaping on this side. Even if the pressure, the circumstances of my life don't change, I can learn sowing and reaping coming from a heart that produces good fruit in my life, my life instead of bad fruit in my life. Listen to Isaiah 61. I just absolutely love uh, these verses. I'm going to read Isaiah 61, 1, and then the first part of verse 2. And this is the, just the beauty of the gospel of what we're promising people, that they don't have to be stuck. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. This is the Messiah talking. Because the Lord has anointed me, he's the Messiah, the anointed one, it's the same word for Christ, the Christos, the anointed one, to bring the good news, and what's our word for that? Gospel. To the afflicted, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, freedom to prisoners, and this is wonderful, to proclaim grace, the favorable year of the Lord. The centrality of the gospel, the Lord didn't just save me to give me an insurance ticket so that I can go to heaven someday. Now, praise God for that, that he did. But the gospel is much more than that. He saves us to change us in Christ-likeness. Even if the circumstances don't change, I can learn to respond differently to the same pressure, traffic, or whatever the pressure is in life, I can respond, my root system can change, my inner person can change because of the power of the gospel so that good fruit comes out. Isn't that good news? Uh, that's the power of the gospel to change lives. And then I can learn new habit patterns and instead of sowing and reaping on this side, through progressive sanctification, I can learn to grow and change sowing and reaping on this side. Now let's go back to our... Uh, I'll, I'll finish filling in the diagram. You wouldn't like me if I didn't fill in the diagram, right? Especially all the control freaks here. You've got to have all the blanks filled in. <laughs> here we go. Let me fill the rest of this in. <clears throat> I think you even have a blank that I don't have on my diagram right down here. Do you have a blank right at the bottom? Okay. Uh, right at the bottom of the cross, you should write these words. The gospel and all its implications. 
you have that. Very good. So the gospel and all of its implications. I like saying that rather than just the gospel because the gospel is not just the good news that you can be saved to go to heaven someday. The gospel is also all kinds of implications of what the Lord wants to do in your life now to change you, to help you grow and change. The Lord didn't leave you stuck so that you're on your own. Look at the resources that he's given you to grow and change and your counselee. There are over 61 another's in the New Testament that we're made for relationship and we're made to come alongside one another to help one another grow in relationship with the Lord. Wayne used this passage. Your word have I treasured or hidden my heart that I may not sin against you. God not only has given us the body of Christ, he's given us the living word of God, and then Galatians 4, 6 says, he has put his Holy Spirit, guess where? In your heart, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, in relationship with the Lord. Incredible resources that the Lord has given us, so we're not on our own to kind of tough it out to try to grow and change. Let's keep going and think about some definitions of the word heart. What is the heart biblically? We're going to look at the Old Testament word here. The Old Testament word, if you want to put it in your notes, is L-E-V, lave. And Brown Driver and Briggs Gesenius uh, Lexicon, that's just a fancy word for a Hebrew uh, dictionary, says this is what the heart is. It's your inner person in contrast to the outer. The inner person with your, think of the counseling implications, it's mind, affections, and will. Or we might say mind, emotions, and will. Even though the word affections here is different than emotions or a little bit different than emotions. So mind, affections, and will reveal the heart. Uh, in your notes, you also have a series of questions called drawing out the purposes of the heart questions. That's back where the diagram was. Those questions revolve around these definitions. I want to ask my counselees questions about their thought processes, their decision making, that's their will, why do they make the decisions that they do, and their emotions. Realizing that all three of those things, biblically, the Lord says, that is your heart, your mind, your emotions, and your will. Number four says, it's specific reference to the inclinations. Why am I inclined a certain way? Resolutions and determinations of the will. It's a synonym for the word conscience. And then these last two, I want to slow down just a little bit and think about the counseling implications here uh, for our counselees and our own lives. Uh, they're saying that all of these hundreds and hundreds of references, when the scriptures use the word heart, it has to do with your appetites. What are you hungry for? And we're using this metaphorically, of course. What are you hungry for? Let me just start throwing out some uh, suggestions. Some people seem really hungry for approval. I have to have people happy with me all the time. Or some people, I'm really hungry. Uh, I just have this appetite to keep my life under control. I've got to be organized. Those are the types of themes that I'm looking for in my counselee. Uh, I believe that the heart, when the scripture talks about the heart being what motivates us on the inside, that the heart is what drives me. Uh, the heart is what is my world revolving around. And often you find it's those type of themes. My life revolves around keeping people happy. My life revolves around keeping my life under control. My life revolves around being as comfortable as possible. Uh, and I'm going to give you a list of suggested themes. And I hope you are starting to get the connection here of why this important, is important. If this is the root system, you can see why this root system is then producing the fruit that's coming out under the pressures of life. So... Here's why this is important. If we don't want biblical counseling to just be behavioristic and just outward, we need to deal with what's motivating our counselees on the inside. 
Uh, remember, Scripture says of some very important things about the heart, and here might be the most important verse. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The Lord is not just interested in behavioristic people. He's interested in people who are loving him from the inside out, from the deepest parts of our being that we're loving him, and that out of that inward person is coming the outward actions. Uh, this next one is really important, the seat of New Testament lusts and desires. Let's dwell on that one just a little bit. The seat of New Testament lusts and desires. What they're saying is that the Old Testament word for heart is synonymous to the New Testament idea, and the Greek word is epithumia, strong desire. Now, when we think, and we have to stop thinking this way, when we think lust, in American culture, we read in the New Testament the word lust, we automatically think sex. That is not how the New Testament uses this word. Now, you're going to want to stone me, possibly, uh, when I say this next thing, but in the Gospel of Luke, guess who this is used of? It's actually used of Jesus. You ready to throw rotten tomatoes at me? Luke chapter 22, Jesus says, and the English translators wisely know they can't translate it lust, right? You can't say that our Lord was lusting. But it says in Luke 22, at the Last Supper, I have been strongly desiring to eat this meal with you. It's the exact same word for lust. What they're saying is that this Old Testament idea of lave, heart, is equivalent to the New Testament idea of strong desire. Strong desire. Humans are made with passion and desires. When I am counseling someone, I am not trying to get them to kill desire. I am not trying to get them to kill passion. Praise God that God made us so that we can be passionate about things. Please don't try to kill passion in your counselee's life. Here's the problem, is we get passionate about the wrong things. We have strong desires about the wrong things instead of the right things. I need to help my counselees learn to have passionate, strong desires about the right things. Putting it bluntly, we don't lust after Christ enough. We need to learn how to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Some questions to get at the heart. Remember the heart has to do with your emotions. So when do you tend to experience fear, worry, or anxiety? Uh, right after this outline are those questions, 14 heart questions, drawing out the purposes of the heart. I pretty much uh, use those 14 questions with virtually all counselees, and it's one of the ways I get started in counseling as a way to get, get started. And as they're filling out those questions, when they fill out those questions for me, I look then for patterns. I look for repeated words, for repeated ideas. I'm, I'm teaching them the three trees diagram. Draw the diag I draw the diagram for them, and then I might ask a question, based upon what we're studying from God's Word about the heart, and based upon the way that you're answering your questions about the heart, what might you call your heart themes? There's something really powerful about a person naming their own heart themes rather than you telling them their heart themes. Uh, I'll do that, but reluctantly. I'd much rather have a person say, well, you know what? I'm coming to realize that I'm more of a control freak than I thought I was. Or I'm much more of a comfort lover than I thought I was. Wow, I'm a people pleaser. I never really understood why I'm so concerned about the approval of people, but now I get it. That's my heart. What's on your mind first thing in the morning? Remember, or last thing at night, or maybe two o'clock in the morning when you wake up because you can't sleep. What's on your mind? And are, you, are there some patterns there? Remember, the heart is about the mind. Where do your eyes drift? Remember, the heart is about the will. You make a decision to use your eyes in a certain way. So why do you look at the things that you look at? And what is that telling you about your inner motivations? In what situations do you struggle with anger? That's back to the emotions. And what 
why do you make the decision to avoid things that you avoid? Now, let's go to Hebrews 4.12, a very important heart passage. And think about Hebrews 4.12 for a few moments. I've heard lots of messages on Hebrews 4.12, but until recent years, didn't hear much about the last phrase of Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12 is uh, one of those wonderful passages of Scripture of why we're biblical counselors. Because the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And because we believe the Word of God is alive, we want to use it to counsel people. But notice what the rest of the verse says. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and it is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now, there are a lot of implications of that little phrase, but just think of one with me. One of the uh, a really popular psychological theory right now is that your inner person is passive and that you're really a victim and you're being acted upon by your environment and you really can't help yourself because you're good on the inside and it's really the environment's fault. It's the culture's fault. Your father didn't love you enough. There's just a whole slew of environmental theories about why you do what you do. Scripture does not say, though, that your inner person is passive. According to this verse, Scripture says that our inner person is active. Uh, here's the way we would put it. You have a worshiping heart. You have a heart that's very alive. It has thoughts. It has intentions. Uh, another way to say it would be this. If I do not learn to discipline my inner person, I will just naturally live out the sinful desires of my heart. Um, you can learn some good theology in Southern Gospel songs every so often. I'm from the South, came here from Virginia, and uh, like Southern Gospel music. Any amens out there? Anybody like Southern Gospel? Uh, here's some theology I learned. Sin will take you farther than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay. <laughs> uh, living out my inner person. I must learn how to discipline my inner person. Let's think about the thoughts and intentions of the heart. First of all, your heart has thoughts. Don't ba bother to write this word down, but let me just give you a couple of definitions there about thoughts. Enthumesis is the word, and it's much more than concrete thought patterns, like the stuff that's just concretely going through your mind right now. This word for heart, the thoughts of your heart, is translated in Luke chapter 2, Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. The thoughts of her heart, the ponderings. It's not just the concrete things, it's kind of those speculations, uh, the imagination, uh, fantasize. What do you daydream about? Uh, the thoughts of the heart. And then your heart has intentions. This word is only used one other time, and it has to do with the purposes, the attitudes, the resolutions, the designs of the inner person. And if you dwell on it a little bit, you see how those two go together, the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Uh, some summary thoughts here, just to think about this for a little bit more. Again, your heart is not passive According to the Bible, my heart is active. Now, this is not what the secular psychologies believe. I want to put a couple of quick quotes up here. I'm going to put some Abraham Maslow up here, famous for his needs hierarchy. And then I'm going to put Carl Rogers up here. They didn't believe in a sin nature. For example, Abraham Maslow, as far as I know, we just don't have any intrinsic instincts for evil. And you read that and you go... Well, where's the problem then? Um, he would say it's your environment, the way your environment acts upon you. If you think in terms of basic needs, instincts at least at the outset are all good or perhaps we should be technical about it and call them premoral, neither good nor evil. A little bit of Carl Rogers here. 
For myself, though I'm very aware of the incredible amount of destructive, cruel, and malevolent behavior in today's world, from the threats of war to the senseless violence in the streets, I do not find that this evil is inherent in human nature. Where does it come from then? Here's a couple more quotes. I see members of the human species like members of other species. And by the way, if you're a species, then what are you? You're an animal, so there's a little bit of evolutionary theory coming out. You're essentially constructive in your fundamental nature, but damaged by their experience. He then went on to say, experience leads me to believe that it is cultural influences which are the major factor in our evil behaviors. Uh, in your notes, you have some summary thoughts about this idea of the heart. And let's just go through there. I have four summary thoughts for you. Let me catch up to where you are. <clears throat> so, for the unbeliever, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is not fundamentally good. Uh, we all know that. We understand it. Bullet point two, I'm trying to capture the idea that something different happens, something different happens when you become a follower of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Something, there's a fundamental change that happens. And I'm trying to capture, though, what is this struggle, though, in the inner person? So the second bullet point says this, as a Christian united with Christ, amen, that's Romans 6, we still struggle with unruly wants, sinful desires, wrong drives, I can be awful needy sometimes, sinful passions, misplaced expectations, what Reformed theology would call remnant sin, even though we are a new creation in Christ. And the last sentence might be the most important. It says, sanctification still must happen in the heart. The Lord wants to change me from the inside out. Third bullet point. I already made this point, so I'll skip over that. And then let's go to Proverbs chapter 20, verse 5. You can understand the heart, but it takes work. Look at Proverbs chapter 20, verse 5. And then we're about to make a crucial transition. Proverbs 20, verse 5. A plan in the heart of a man is like deep water. Let's stop and think about that little phrase for a little bit. The plan in the heart of a man is like deep water. Think of an old-fashioned well. And uh, get the picture in your mind of the little roof over it, and it's got the bucket going down into the well. Can you kind of picture that? So we got the bucket going down into the well, and the bucket's going down, and you're standing over the edge of the well, and you're watching the bucket go down, and after a few feet, it disappears because it's dark down there, and it's uh, going deep down in the water. The plan in the heart of a man is like deep water. It's, it's hard. Am I ever always going to, am I going to ever uh, completely understand the motives of my heart? Absolutely not. But... Can I understand the motives of my heart? Yes. A man of understanding draws it out. Think of another synonym for understanding in the book of Proverbs. What would that word be? Wisdom. So uh, part of our dream in the biblical counseling movement is to teach people to learn to be heart-wise, to start be a little more tuned in to the motivations of your inner person Especially because Scripture says the Lord wants us to love him out of our inner person with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now let's make a, a crucial transition here. And it's going to sound like a logical jump for just a moment. But I really believe that the heart is our worship center. Uh, just think of this verse. And this isn't in your notes, but this will help uh, get the idea right off the bat here. Matthew 6, 21, our Lord says something really important. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I do not believe, and I grappled with this for a long time, is the Lord saying that what you invest in, your heart will change, your heart will follow, or is the Lord saying that what you're investing in reveals where your heart already is? 
after a lot of debate in my mind, I came down on the second one, that where your treasure is, that's revealing where your heart is also. Now let's just think about treasure for just a moment uh, to make the connection with worship. Uh, the old English word for worship is, anybody know? Worthship. Very good. The old English word for worship is worthship. Uh, why do we go to church on Sunday morning? Because the Lord is worth it. We value him. We treasure him. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We need to ask our counselees and start with ourselves so that we're not hypocrites when we are teaching our counselees, what is it that my inner person treasures? Well, how can you tell when a person treasures something? What are they investing in? What do they talk about? You can uh, just go right through the list and think about how to tell what a person considers valuable. And it starts to bring together all the pieces of what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I hope you're getting the idea that when someone comes for counseling, it's not just about, um, I'm going to help them with their depression. I'm going to help them with their fear. Really what I'm going after, because as Wayne so, uh, said it so well in the last session, it's about making disciples it might take a paradigm shift for this person of what are you living for? What do you value? What are you treasuring in your heart? It's really all about worship. Uh, I believe we were made to be worshipers of the true and living God. Lots of different verses we could go to. For the sake of time, I'm just going to quote that famous one right there, 1 Corinthians 10:31. Uh, don't, don't miss the one little phrase. It's so important. Uh, we often quote it this way, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. And that misses the significant phrase, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Uh, if you think about that diagram again, that includes the heat of my life, which might be traffic in L.A. How do I drive in this traffic as an act of worship? That's a tough one, isn't it? How do I drive in this traffic as an act of worship? So even though the circumstance, the heat in my life, the pressure may not change, on the left-hand side of the diagram, the way I'm responding from my inner person to the pressure in life can change because instead of worshiping what I was worshiping on the right-hand side, I'm learning to worship the Lord on the left-hand side. This is why back on that diagram we had on the right-hand side worship of idols. Uh, John Calvin put it this way, the human heart is like a cauldron constantly bubbling forth idols. It is just the tendency of humans to put things in the place of God. Uh, that's the next point in the outline. It, Romans 1.25, just so you can see it with your own eyes, turn there with me. Romans 1.25 is a basic verse about human nature. Romans 1.25 basic verse about humanity says this, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Think the three trees diagram again. Got right hand side, left hand side. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. And Paul can't help himself. He's a worshiper. So he says, who is blessed forever. Amen. Worshiping and serving the creature rather than the Creator. And I already have, I already quoted Matthew 6 21 for you, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now I'm going to put a picture up on the screen and you're going to go, okay, this is a stretch, but here you go. <laughs> Why is it? I know what you're thinking now. Now he's going to meddling. <laughs> Why is it that under the pressure of life, think with me if you would for a moment, beloved. Why is it that under the pressure of life, we think, I need a good, strong cup of Starbucks rather than I need to go spend some time with the Lord? Um, or this one. I actually saw this in a coffee shop, and it was on a bumper sticker, and here's what they had on the bumper sticker. It said, literally, that picture, and then it said, coffee is God. We worship and serve the creation 
rather than the Creator. We were made for relationship with the Creator. We were made for something incredibly big. We were made for Him to be, as Psalm 18 says, our rock, our fortress, our refuge. But we have a tendency to turn to things like that, or maybe that. Um, let's think about this for a moment. You can't help but being religious. If I would say to you, a man does his job religiously, what does that mean? And I've done this with a lot of people. All kinds of things come up. It's this list. A man does his job religiously. He studies it. He's dedicated to it. He sings the praise of his company. He likes to talk about it, and I'm using a religious word. He witnesses about it. He sacrifices for it. He ascribes worth to it. He gets excited about it. It becomes his identity. Well, you know, I've seen those kind of activities in a place like this. I ministered for 14 years in Blacksburg, Virginia, the home of the Virginia Tech Hokies, so that's a VT on the field there. And uh, lots, if you go back to that list, I saw lots of those things going on on Saturdays because humans are religious Humans are looking for meaning and purpose in life. Uh, what you should be hearing right now as we are working with our counselees about fear and worry and anxiety is that it's really deeper than that. There's a worship problem going on in the heart of my counselee. Um, Augustine said it this way, O oh Lord, you made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until it finds its rest in you. John Piper put it this way, the world has an inconsolable longing. It tries to satisfy the longing with scenic vacations, accomplishments of creativity, stunning cinematic productions, sexual exploits, sports extravagans extravaganzas, drugs, ascetic rigors, managerial excellence, but the longing remains. What does this mean? We're made for something bigger is what it means. We're made for relationship with the Creator. So what are we doing with our counselees? We're going deeper. They came in thinking their problem's this deep. Guess what? Their problem's this deep because there's a worship problem going on in the person's heart. I'm gonna skip ahead to the end uh, because we need to uh, rock, or, uh, wrap this up. But I have in your, right at the very end, some suggested words, suggested themes, and here's what I'd like to challenge you to do. Take those heart questions, those 14 heart questions, and go back through them and answer them for yourself. Take the three trees diagram and plug yourself into the pictures of the diagram. What's causing the pressure in your life? What's the fruit that's coming out on the uh, right-hand side, the bad fruit? And as you answer those 14 heart questions, Ask yourself, what are the patterns that I'm seeing about what could be going on in my inner person? And don't be surprised if it's some of those words. Wow, I'm more of a comfort lover than I thought. Or um, control is a big deal in my life. Or keeping people happy is a really big deal in my life. That's what the Bible would call the fear of man or people pleasing. There's all kinds of words and all you have to do is ask yourself, what is it that I'm desiring? What is it that it seems like my life revolves around? All humans are religious. The human heart is like a cauldron constantly bubbling forth idols, as John Calvin said. Counseling problems are not just about the depression, the fear, the worry, or whatever the counseling presenting problem is. In essence, what we're saying is that biblical counseling is trying to figure out the worship disorder in the person's life that is the root system of the inner person. I hope this brief presentation brings new meaning to the idea of the Lord saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength.